My name is Ophelia Chong. I'm not related to Tommy. And how I describe myself to people when I meet them, I'm short, yellow, and I'm in cannabis. We're in Denver, Mile High Denver, of course. And so I'm here for the NCIA. And what, how they invited me was because they started this new program called um, Association of Alliances Program. I think I might got that backwards, but anyhow, it is uh, gathering all the associations in the states that have that are involved in cannabis. And I'm the smallest one. Most of the other ones are uh, groups of 150 growers or more from everywhere from Washington to Vermont to New Jersey, so to Texas and California. So you can imagine how big this group is and maybe how small it is because there are about 15 of us in a room. And so we are all coming together to create this group to further education on cannabis in as associations and nonprofits. So that's why I'm here in Denver. The group is all about combining the power of associations and normally to join the NCI, NCI which is a um, it's an advocacy group for the industry, for the cannabis industry. And but that does that is completely different than the associations for growers or manufacturers because these are more smaller tinier groups that now the NCIA, NCIA wants to bring in under their wing and so for me it was for Asian Americans for cannabis education. My other, my business is actually Stockpot Images which we are the Getty of cannabis but however I'm still involved in, both of them are basically making people aware and to destigmatize the stereotypes of people in cannabis. So Stockpot overall is for everybody of all color, let's, we're destigmatizing, but for Asian Americans, it's specifically for my community to, to dispel that stereotype that they've been fed. Because we, as a culture and a group, we are tagged as, we stay inside the box, we don't break the law, we pay our parking tickets. We're, and I also was told by somebody at the association when I said, I'm the only person of color here, he says, no, you're not, you're Asian, you're considered white. And I went, mm-hmm, okay. So this, uh, my purpose of joining this group is to educate those people in the room as well, uh, not only inside campus and, out and, and outside, because being told I'm white in a room full of white people, is that to make me feel better that, hey, we're all buddies, or is it to say, you shouldn't have a problem. Why, are, why do you, your people have a problem with this? So for me, I realized at that moment, I was there for them about for about 50% of the time, and the other 50% are the people outside of cannabis. So to put it in a nutshell, that's what was going on. Okay, this will be fun. Uh, the name of the group is Asian Americans for Cannabis Education. We call it ACE because we always get A's, but just not we're true because I failed all my math classes. So we're not all what you would think is a typical stereotype Asian. And then again, Asians stereotype outside of Asians. We stereotype just as much as anyone else. So if what I'm working against is a stereotype of cannabis users within my own community to show that uh, there are benefits to the plant, that it is not how what they've been fed. Uh, so that's Asian Americans for Cannabis Education. How it started was again, uh, when I started Stockpot Images, I have one photographer, Monica Lo, um, she's Chinese. We said, there aren't any Asians up, so why don't we start a group? So we did, and there's three of us, Monica Lo, Tiffany Wu, and myself. And we ran it for a year, but then the Tiffany and Monica were getting too busy, and so they, they said, do you want, do you want this? And of course, me being the hoarder and taking home every leftover on the table, I said, sure, I'll take it. And I didn't know what to do with it. So once I had that moment of I better, something better happen with this or this, all this work can be gone, I started doing interviews. So I actually started tracking down Asian Americans in cannabis and said, can I talk to you? Can I give you some questions? And can you please be on this site? and then show your face. And all of them said yes. So in my group in that I feature, it's Dr. Jeffrey Chen of UCLA, Dr. Pham of Berkeley, Ann Solis, who owns two dispensaries, so used to be American, in Vallejo, Monterey Park, in Monterey Bay. So this is who now I'm showing are in cannabis and they are Yale educated, Harvard. 
Stanford. So these are all dream children of Asian parents and they're in cannabis. So they can't, why is it wrong? So that is my purpose with this group. For Asian Americans, for cannabis education, what I would like to see is I am now making inroads into the state government um, on a state level with uh, John Chang, who's the state treasurer, and he's pro-cannabis. We've been talking to his aides and, and offering Asian Americans for cannabis education to go behind him. And also um, with Scott, Senator Scott Weiner of San Francisco, also we're supporting him as well. My, my goal is to push our advocacy, even though I'm very, very tiny. And, but we, there is no one else like us out there. There is no other group. We can at least have a little bit of a voice and say we do support these politicians that support cannabis because we're a tiny voice, but we can try. There is a hate group up in San Francisco. Um, they've been called out by a Southern Poverty Law Group. Um, it is a evangelistic Christian group that protests every cannabis dispensary store opening in San Francisco. And what they do is they bus in grandmas, Chinese grandmas, with printed out signs, they're laminated, it's very Asian, it's clean, all, I mean, God, everything is all design, it's laminated, it's no cheapo, sharpie, I mean, they're organized, they hand out the signs, they get on the bus, so within our community, there's still a lot of hate and misinformation, so my, I don't think I'll ever get to them, but I can chip away at their relatives, at their children who are far more open-minded um, because most of these women are in their 80s, 60s to 80s, and this is their only social group. So if they go against what their pastor is saying, they basically become pariahs. Um, so I feel like they're being held hostage. Um, but for other Asian groups, my age, younger, we're more accepting because in the last election, Prop 64, 56% of Asian Americans vote were pro-cannabis. So my work is fairly done, it's now what I realized this weekend is that now my work has to go out to the non-Asians and to educate them that we, we are in this industry and we have a lot to offer. So recognize that with that, the fact that we're here. In general, if I'm considered more white than Asian, then they don't see me, they don't see that I have an issue of moving forward in cannabis. And in a way, too, we don't have that much of an issue moving towards into cannabis because as Asians, all well, Chinese, all our vape pens come from China. China basically supports the ancillary products in the States, which then support the cannabis because there's not one vape pen, not one pill bottle, one exit bag that does not come from China. But probably maybe only 15-20% of the products are printed here, but there are small runs. And so our entry into the market is, is huge, it's ancillary, we know about the money. One time I was on a shuttle bus and there was four other Caucasian people in the shuttle bus and we were talking about where we were going and they asked me, so what do you do? And I told them I'm in the cannabis industry and they said, no, yeah, you don't look stoned, are you stoned right now? And this is six o'clock in the morning and I asked them, okay, if I was, if I told you I was a wine, a wine, wine maker, and I'm sitting here in a bus, would you ask me if I'm drunk? And they went, oh, you know, you're right. And I said, well, then really asking me if I'm stoned all day is, is the same sort of thing. It, you have to change your perceptions of, just because I'm in this business does not mean I'm drunk all day, or I'm stoned all day, or that, I go home and I'm fixing my toilet after being a plumber for 24 hours. It's You are working on a stereotype that you've been fed. And just because I touched a plant doesn't mean you have this idea that I'm a drug addict or I'm a convict, I'm, I have a felony. So this is all propaganda that you've been fed for 100 years and now we have to try and work on this. That's my biggest issue. It's not within my community, but also outside of it. Stockpot images. To put it simply, we're the Getty of cannabis, and we're the only cannabis-focused stock agency in the world. Just like Asian Americans for cannabis education, I hit on two niches that no one else has touched. And so for Stockpot Images, what I created three years ago, no one was doing it yet. And 
it's not because I saw a trend coming. It wasn't because I said, oh, you know, we're going to legalize soon. I got to jump on this. It was because my sister was sick and was using cannabis. And I looked at her and I thought, geez, she's a stoner. Just like I said, you know, people were, well, I got insulted. So now I looked at her and I thought, she's a stoner. But it hurt me so much because I called her something I thought was derogatory. And that's how Stockpot started. It wasn't started because I saw this trend coming. I didn't see billions coming out. It was started because of my sister. And now as we're rolling forward, we're partnered with Adobe, but the mission is still the same, is still to destigmatize how what how I saw cannabis users. And I learned a lot. Basically I learned how to grow. I learned everything about the plant to create this company. And now I'm so embedded in it that I see the future as Stockpot now as an archive not a business, but as an archive of all the history of cannabis because we have over 3,000 strains of ripe and cured flowers. We have photos from the 70s up until now. And also we're starting a whole collection on psychosilivin, on magic mushrooms, because I see that as another avenue of enlightenment too that we should look at. Um, and also the Dennis Perone collection. He co-wrote Prop 215, which brought cannabis medicinal to cannabis 21 years ago so it wasn't for him i wouldn't be sitting here talking to you about cannabis i don't think anyone would be so stockpot now to me is an online archive i can keep that thing going forever just as an archive of the history of cannabis all in one spot i don't see it as uh, a business that i'm going to retire on i see it as a legacy uh, how I select photographers is, uh, in the first few months when I began, I had to go and find them. But uh, after about three months, everyone comes to me now. So I, I have a link on my site on Stockpot Images to contact me as your photographer. So what I look at is, because I've taught photography for seven years, plus I've been in photography for 30 years. So I look for composition, lighting, uh, sense of style, and also a real personal take on it not just a bland stock photo but someone's artful view of what it looks like and nine out of ten times i'll take most of the people that come to me and the i tell them there's only one rule that we have that we do not do a stock pot we do not objectify women so i don't want an image a naked woman bent over a table holding a joint I mean, I do have images of really cute girls in baseball caps and cut off shorts and t-shirts, but they, it's more playful. It's the images that most people come to mind, say um, 420 nurses or anything, say think strip joint with marijuana leaves. We don't take that because once I say that's okay in our archive, then people will say, oh, then it must be okay. Cause this, this company who is out there is saying, your licensing, so it must be all right to do it. No, once I open that gate, then it all changes. So right now I have the luxury of holding that, being the only one not doing it, and and saying no. And so far for three years, I've we've gone, we've we our our images of buds are sexier than anything else that anyone else wants right now. It's just sexy buds. The issue of women, um, half naked women. It's not the issue of half-naked women. It's the issue of how the woman is portrayed as an object to sell another object. Uh, and it's, we're, not, we're not looking at her personality. We're not looking at her creativity. We're looking at her, her physical attributes to sell a product. And then it, so that becomes everything's, an op, everything's objectified in there. And plus, we have this new mainstream clientele is that how we associate buds it's buds and boobs boobs and buds and butts oh i actually could make a really great name for a dispensary boobs butts and buds and you would know exactly what you're going to get in there but that's not who what this industry is about it's about medicine and what does a half naked woman do with medicine nothing it's to sell a product cheap and fast if you need to have a half naked woman to sell your weed you're, you got some stepped on weed there. That means that stuff is yeasty and moldy. If you got to have something like that to sell it, then that's, I wouldn't buy your, your product because obviously you need to sell it really fast and you need to sell it through objectification. Are there advantages or disadvantages being a woman in an industry? I haven't found any. Um, because 
any woman in any industry has, we've all been subjected to harassment on the job or off color comments. We've, we've all gone through that. Uh, however, I have not found that in cannabis. Um, on the flip side, I have found the most support through, through men and women in this industry that I've not found in any other industry. And we also found that I've made so many new friends in this industry as opposed to when I worked in entertainment or printing or publishing. This community is joined together, not because we just sell or promote the same product, we all use it. And so we're, it's just hard to describe how, and I, this is an overused word, but how chill we all are. And, but there are obstacles where now we're seeing a whole new group coming in where it is people outside the industry with a lot of money or people coming in and promising everything in the rainbow and a unicorn but not delivering because they're taking advantage of other people. So that's what I'm seeing now what men and women are going through is shifting through what's true and what's not because it's the, land, the ground underneath us is shifting so quickly that there's new regulations, new laws, new threats coming in that I don't think there's anyone who knows everything that's happening right now. But if someone does come to you and says they do and they want $5,000, step back a little bit. That's what's, what I'm finding more of the hurdles rather than any harassment. I'm seeing more snake oil. And I think that's what's going to hurt our industry rather than sexual harassment and all that. We have, we have a lock. We don't have a lock on it, but we're all aware. I think it's now more watching out for others that they're not pulled into businesses that are not upfront. In my free time, which is probably on Sundays, I'll go outside and I'll stand and stare at my three plants. And I'll just look at it. If you saw me from outside my yard, you would just see this woman staring down, looking at three plants and go, are you okay? Are you okay? You look good, you look good. That's what I do. I just stare at my plants. Um, I'm growing three small little plants right now because it's winter, but also I'm experimenting by growing mushrooms as well. So my whole backyard is a giant experiment of growing things. That's how I learned to grow cannabis as well. I used my backyard and grew a lot of plants back there to learn about cannabis. And now I'm still growing it, but I'm still growing mushrooms too because I'm learning about mushrooms, how to grow them, their life cycle, how they look in the wild. and that is my downtime, is my lab. I go in my backyard and it's a lab because everything I work with is alive and needs to grow and needs water and sun. So I go out there and go, are you okay? What's happening? Come on, mushrooms. This is your time, right? So that's what I do in my downtime is I work in my outdoor lab. I'm asked a lot um, by people how to get into the cannabis industry. And so my first question is, what are you good at, right? Are you really a great accountant? Are you a great attorney? Are you a great designer? So what are you really good at? Because all you gotta do is add cannabis. Just like when you go into a dispensary, there are drinks, there's chocolates, there's mints, there's topicals. So everything in the industry is already made, you just add cannabis. So to go into the cannabis industry, what are you really great at? And if you're a great accountant, you start learning the laws and you become that accountant that the industry needs because you understand the laws concerning cannabis, which is a lot of words, myriad, but if you know it, you will be hired a lot. So, because some people will say, I want to get in cannabis. Well, what do you want to do? I want to grow. No, you don't want to grow. That's very hard work. Plus, do you really want to work on minimum wage, bent over, picking leaves all day? That's not sexy. Uh, unless you want to work your way up to being a top cultivator, you know, plan on five to 10 years. But if you want to enter now, what are you good at? Just add cannabis. What is gonna happen in cannabis? I would say stick with it. Why not? We, you cannot be governed by fear. If, and then I'm gonna ask you, what are you afraid of? Oh, we're gonna have my business shut down. I'm gonna have lose this. Then take that. You did lose your business. What are you gonna do? You're gonna start another one. Really, if you wanna get into a safe thing, open up a card shop, but that's not safe either. You're going to shut down in three weeks or three years. If you want safe, get a KFC franchise. If you want excitement, but also a lot of opportunity and learning more, right? You don't want to go stagnant in your life. You want to keep learning, go into cannabis because 
it is risky. It is only for not not for the faint of heart. But if you can imagine, do you remember Internet ninety seven? People think, ah, you know, not ah, who's gonna order online? Ah, I was gonna I'm gonna buy my CD till the day I die. Right? Then what happened? Napster, right? Amazon. And it changed this whole paradigm of how we shopped. And so now when you're looking at cannabis, it's cannabis 2018, just like Internet 97. We're at this part where you can create this whole industry. You can walk in and say, we're going to make this. And everyone goes, okay. You don't hear about that. In under, you don't hear, I'm going to make a new cupcake. And everyone goes, yeah, we're going to start 15 associations just on cupcakes. And we're going to... I want to be a cupcake guy. I well, how do I get into cupcakes? No, but when you say cannabis, you go. It's an open field. It's all blue sky. It is whatever you want to make it into. You can just have a lot of fortitude, some money packed away, and expect to be entertained every day of your life. The most fun things I've done in cannabis is judging. Uh, last year, I judged twice for High Times and once for the Golden Tarp, which is up in Garberville. Um, I'll get that to that in a second. But for High Times, I got selected to judge twice for Indica, for the strength, because I don't like vaping, I don't like dabbing. So they said, okay, Ophelia, come pick up your judge kit. And I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to go and get a little bit of everything. I walk in, I thought, oh my God, I'm going to have to go to Costco or write and buy a plastic bin because I had to drive it back to Los Angeles from San Francisco, the first one I had to judge. And it was 38 jars of indica. And the second time I did it in LA, and I again, I looked at this big shopping bag. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to smoke through this in five days and give, you know, somewhat sane commentary. But um, the way I do it is I use a, a Pax vaporizer so I don't get... I don't get high very quickly and I can taste all the flavor. I can see how it burns. So that's how I was able to go through 38 plus 29 strains. And, but the most fun memory I've ever had and best thing ever, why I'm so glad I'm here, I got asked to judge Golden Tarp. And the Golden Tarp is run by Kevin Jodry of Wonderland Nurseries. It's in the woods in Garberville. So all the judges were sitting outside the old carriage house, which was built by um, Al Capone's number one guy who gave him a lot of money and said, you got to leave now, Bob, because they're going to come after you. So he went to Garberville and built all these homes uh, in the 1920s. And one of them is a carriage house. So that's where we were judging. So we were judging in the sun on couches that they dragged outside under 100 foot tall redwood trees, smoking cannabis in the woods where all the farmers were. And I was sitting there in the sun and I thought, this is why cannabis is so great because farmers were walking around, everyone's saying hi and hugging and trying strains and just the smell of the leaves. And I thought, this is the best thing ever. And if, when I die, I want this on my tombstone. Best time ever in Garberville. So yes, I'm, those, that one moment in Garberville has made me so happy. And if I never do anything in cannabis again, I'm done, I'm good. Hey, Jay, that stuff makes you a stupid into cabeza. Jenny, my ex-wife, is amazing. She is from Bogota, Colombia. She sounds like my high school health teacher who talks about the evils of alcohol, sex, and cannabis. I am unable to understand why Colombians and others across the world demonize marijuana. The United States and its prohibitionist ideology fails to convince me and other citizens that cannabis ruins your brain. Since age 14, I have used and loved cannabis. It helped calm the chaos of alcoholism and drugs, which were just a normal part of my family life. Being a daily user did not prevent me from achieving a 3.8 grade point average and graduating high school at the top 14% of my class. Having zero money for college, I joined the Air Force. My job was to balance a 500,000 pound airplane mathematically with my brain while flying 24 hour days. 
Loadmasters are required to know every dimension, every crack of the Boeing C-17 inside and out. I completed scary and highly dangerous missions. During routine airdrop missions, I opened the door in flight with a parachute on to drop food, water, and supplies to soldiers in remote locations in Afghanistan. I flew National Science Foundation scientists of all different backgrounds to Antarctica, where I filmed penguins less than five feet away from me. The 10 years I was in the Air Force, I was of course cannabis free. On the day my military contract ended, I restarted cannabis consumption. It was one of the happiest days of my life. I married Jenny as I was transitioning to becoming a land surveyor. Jenny and I moved to North Dakota where I was surveying some intense landscapes in sub-zero temps. I J, I don't understand how you can a smoke and a smoke and a smoke and still do your notes. She's referring to my survey notes that I create, depicting whatever data I gathered for the day. I don't know either. I guess all of the science that says cannabis degrades your cognitive function is a conspiracy across the world, haha. <laughs> I teased her. We relocated from North Dakota to Colorado to be closer to my son, for me to start college, and for low-cost medicinal cannabis. As an aviator, I was always nose deep inside of a map. This concept was only heightened as a surveyor, so it only made sense in my brain to study GIS, aka cartography. With many engineering ideas flowing through my brain, I chose to study computer automated drafting and design, with hopes of making the visions come to life. One such vision was of a Japanese gazebo. For my final class project, I found an inspirational pagoda online and designed my own 2D version of it. Being 25% German, and as Frankfurt is my birthplace, I have a huge affinity for castles. This love was only compounded by the fact that I flew missions out of Germany for a decade. I was able to see too many castles to count. I've even walked around the famous Disneyland castle, or rather the new Schwanstein castle in Bavaria. This passion led me to obsess over how to design the best and smallest castle feasible which also doubles as my future dream house when cannabis pays me big bucks one day. The castle I ended up creating helped pave my way to becoming a certified drafter designer. As a chemical engineer student, my brain is constantly filled with complex symbols, numbers, and equations. With free time, if not practicing the guitar or piano relentlessly, I'll be playing the app Chess with Friends throughout the day or hiking the creek vaping cannabis. Sadly, a large part of society would label me a stoner and think that stoners are flat out dumb or struggle with memory. Why can't the world see the good in cannabis or see beyond only medicinal purposes? I suppose it'll take me getting a PhD to help convince the people. Challenge accepted. Mm -hmm.